Welcome to Book Spectrum. I'm Chris Cordani, your host. This is where we talk to uh, not necessarily seasoned authors all the time, but we do have some. We like to talk to people who write books from varied professions across the spectrum. I have one such writer right now. History seems to have been lost in today's youth and popular culture. It's been minimized and not a new thing. From Howard Zinn's oversimplification of his revisionist history on forward, the erasure of facts in favor of politics has become a threat to the nation's very existence and unity. It's like people don't even understand how important the Revolutionary War was anymore. Well, I have uh, a remedy for that. With me is Jack Warren Jr. His book, Freedom, The Enduring Importance of the American Revolution, takes a serious look at its place, not only in American history, but in that of the world. Welcome to Book Spectrum, Jack Warren Jr. Delighted to be with you. I like the book. I'm a Revolutionary War guy. Funny thing, though, it's the Civil War that's attracted many of those reenactors and fascinates people who we call Civil War buffs. We don't generally see that with the Revolutionary War so much. Why might that be from your perspective as an historian, Jack? Well, people of the Civil War generation are more like us. They were more romantic. Uh, they were more individualistic. Uh, their letters, their diaries speak to us in a way that, that those from the 18th century don't um, because they talk a lot about themselves and their feelings. And people in the 18th century were much more guarded with those things. And so they don't give them to us as much. So the passion of the Civil War comes through in the record. Also, the Civil War was photographed and we can see you know, people of that generation and they look like us. Uh, the, the Revolutionary War is known to us visually only through paintings and, and prints. And uh, often people look old and stodgy. The styles are different. Um, you know, men with powdered wigs and, and funny clothes. They don't seem to be much like us. And so it doesn't, you know, doesn't resonate with people as much as it ought to. And that I hope to ensure that it does in the future. And here I thought it was the cool pointy beards they had during the Civil War. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, uh, I actually took a picture next to the guy who played AP Hill in the, uh, Rob Maxwell, the Ron Maxwell movies about the civil war. So, uh, he was pretty cool. He's a real historian. A lot of the historians got to be in the movie, which is pretty, yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, the movies, I should say. Uh, anyway, let's get to this though. What inspired you to create this introspective into the revolutionary war? Well, there are, I will confess a fair number of general histories of the American revolution. But in our generation, uh, appreciation, understanding of the revolution and its long-term consequences for American history and for us today has been slipping away. Uh, part of it is what you talked about at the top. You know, there's an increasing politicization of our history. Um, also, we have an inclination, understandable, but, but in some ways unfortunate, of making ourselves the rhetorical judges of people in the past and deciding if they didn't share our standards about everything, then they aren't worthy of our respect. Um, what I'm trying to achieve in this book is first understanding of what the revolution achieved and then appreciation for the enduring importance of those achievements and the way they shape our lives today. America was one of the, probably the first really free society, if you will. There were a lot of monarchies at the time uh, before that, there were fiefdoms, there uh, were some dictatorships, ma mainly monarchies, though, uh, and, and some kind of tribal leadership here and there in certain uh, corners of the world. Um, how did the American Revolution, again, as an historian from your perspective, lay the foundation not only for us, but for, uh, for free societies around the world? Well, you've hit on, on the critical importance of the American Revolution. Before the American Revolution, I'll go a little farther than you did. Um, the, before the American Revolution, no one was free, at least in the way we understand freedom. Everyone in the world was the subject of some kind of monarch. They may have been a czar, an emperor, a chief, whatever they were, they ruled by some kind of hereditary right or, some, or they were the instrument of an oligarchy or an autocracy, uh, freedom in all of its rich variety, which is what I try to sketch in this book, freedom was in many ways uh, first realized, first invented, really, 
by the American revolutionaries. Now, the ideas of free society are very old. They go back to antiquity. Uh, and scholars and philosophers were writing about them in the 17th and 18th century. But there's a big difference between what, you know, philosophers and, and coffeehouse radicals talk about, you know, when they're sitting in a cafe in Europe or over their desks writing books uh, and people actually fighting to realize those principles and then making them the basis of a new kind of public life. And that's what the revolution did. Um, and ever since, uh, the ideas of freedom, the idea of Republican government, representative government, which supports and it reflects the interests of ordinary people, have been spreading around the world. At the time of the American Revolution, Rousseau, the great French philosopher, said, mankind was made to be free, but everywhere he is in chains. Uh, the revolution began up the process of shedding those chains, but there are still billions of people in this world who don't live in free societies. And so the ideas of the American Revolution need to be remembered, renewed, appreciated, understood, perpetuated by Americans uh, in order to, to continue to, to be a living representative of the ideals of free people. I want to get into free societies and modern thought today, but first let's delve into the book again. And I have with me Jack Warren Jr. The book is Freedom, the Enduring Importance of the American Revolution. We know the big guys. We know your Washingtons, the Franklins of the world, the Henrys and people like that. What I like about this book is it also delves into some of the uh, lesser known guys and ladies who uh, helped shape the revolution. Let's talk about some of them. Well, that's what I think may, sets my perspective on the revolution apart from a lot of narrative historians who've written about the American Revolution. Uh, I regard the American Revolution and treat it in this book as a vast popular movement. Um, it involves the, the aspirations, the hopes and dreams of ordinary people from all walks of American life, um, of women, of indentured servants, of slaves, uh, of, of poor people who hope that the revolution will be and provide them with opportunities to, to improve the quality of the life for themselves and their families. And I focus, as you go through the narrative, I focus on specific individuals uh, who, who illustrate that concept. These are people who didn't necessarily, you know, they didn't read John Locke or Montesquieu. They weren't sophisticated thinkers, but they knew what they hoped for for themselves. And they saw the revolution as, uh, as offering them the possibility of a better life for them and for their children. Not all American societies when, or colonial societies when they moved into the new world were actually free. I don't consider the, now the Puritans were looking for freedom of religion, but I don't consider them a free society. The Jamestown settlement was more in, in that vein. But when the colonies kind of moved to 13 here and, and there were different kind of, there were different people, different uh, uh, weather conditions, different, uh, I, I mean, obviously there were differences between the rural and, and again, for lack of a better term, urban settings at the time. Uh, how did those people get together and, and find a common interest to fight against the king? In hindsight, it looks, you know, everything in hindsight that happens looks like it's ordained. Uh, but the American colonies, the British colonies that participate in the revolution, which is only some of the British colonies in the Americas, uh, from Georgia to Maine, which was then a part of Massachusetts, in a, a vast, you know, space, uh, varied people who don't act, didn't actually at the time of the revolution trade a great deal with one another. You know, a merchant in Charleston or Savannah was far more likely to have regular uh, communication with merchants in London or Bristol in England than with somebody in Boston or New York. What, what brought these disparate colonies together was the anxiety, the, the crisis that developed uh, in the 1760s and early 1770s as Britain, uh, the British ministry, the British government sought to impose more regulation, more regularity, um, more taxation on the American colonies. They shared anxiety about these developments uh, and it brought them together. 
there's a, in, in the book, there's a story. Um, some of your so, some of your listeners will know this one, uh, although it's not the Boston Tea Party or the, the, the Boston Massacre. It's not the most famous incident. Yeah, the massacre uh, that killed three people. I love that. <laughs> uh, well, no, 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 no. I, I'm joking. I joke about that. I know it was it was a horrible, me, a horrible let me, shooting. <laughs> let me get you a look. There were fifteen thousand people in Boston at the time of the Boston massacre. Um, if a, 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 a an army killed the same proportion of people in Washington D.C. today, three hundred people would be shot down. Um, that is the, the one of the things that deceives us about the American Revolution is the intimate scale. Boston, Massachusetts was one of the biggest towns in colonial America. 15,000 people. That's that's barely a, a, a town on the highway that you're going to notice today. Um, this was a small, intimate, face to face society. And so, yeah, a, a, a party of soldiers shoots down several civilians um, in a small, t- in a small town like that, um, is a massacre. Um, and you know, that's not propaganda. This was right. an extraordinary event. Um, but you got me off, off track. <laughs> I, I know. I, I like the off track thing. I want to pull you off track one more time because I, I did want to discuss some of the lesser known types and a lot of them happen to have been in George Washington's setup of a, or, or his spy network. Basically, I was, was always fascinated with Washington's setup of the early spy networks infiltrating the uh uh let's just say infiltrating the british leadership if you will um well washington had look set the, setting the bigger picture right and we uh, can't know who all of them are by the way not even agent 355 so. yeah no no we and and we never will but washington you know was we faced with an overwhelming task. The, 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 the British army, which was not, by the way, the largest or most powerful army of the age, um, certainly the French army was much larger and better supplied than the British army, but the British did have the most powerful navy in the world, um, which really mattered to the American colonies since almost all the American colonists lived within 100 miles of, of the sea, uh, very close to navigable water. So the, the largest navy in the world was a huge threat to the American colonies to and Washington's army didn't have basic supplies. Uh, America didn't produce enough gunpowder. It certainly couldn't produce guns uh, on a scale that were needed by an army. Um, Washington didn't have a he didn't have an existing army to lean back on, no navy. But he did have the advantage that the war was being fought in his own backyard. It was being fought in America, and Americans could be recruited to spy on the British, to, to, to supply intelligence uh, to Washington's army. And Washington uh, very carefully created his own spy network um, uh, to bring in the intelligence about what the British were doing, where they, what their next move would be. Uh, and, of course, that's the, that's the enormous advantage when you have when you're fighting on your home turf. That's the home field advantage, if you will. <laughs> it was one of the only ones we had. Another thing about the book, and I'm a map guy, this book did pack, you did pack the book with what, 170 something paintings and maps? Yeah. Yeah. No they way. help tell the entire story because I look, I, again, I'm, I'm an old map kind of guy, but the fact is the, the, the adage is a picture shows uh, the thousand words type thing. But um, again, you were saying the Civil War had its advantages with the pictures and everything else. The Revolutionary War didn't, but you did have the paintings and you did have maps that did tell an interesting story. You do. Um, and it's actually one of the great eras of, of cartography and the maps are beautiful. Um, a lot of them are drawn from the collection of the Society of the Cincinnati, um, and which is a, a, has a great library dealing with the art of war in the age of the American Revolution. These are contemporary maps, not modern maps. So the kind of maps that people at the time were looking at, uh, including generals looking at them to to plan, uh, you know, plan their campaigns. So I I wanted to draw the reader as much as possible into an age when we don't have photographs and obviously we don't have video and film. We can't, to imagine it, we need to be able to see it. And so the book is richly illustrated in that way. We also pull in uh, portraits, we hope unexpected ones um, 
of, you know, there's no Gilbert Stuart portrait of George Washington in this book, but there are a lot of paintings of Washington, of, of his officers, of contemporaries, uh, watercolors of, of ordinary people, uh, of the French and, and the Hessians. And so it, it, it's intended to be a visual introduction to the surviving record of the American Revolution. Um, I hope we've achieved that. With me is Jack Warren Jr. He is the uh, author of uh, Freedom, The Enduring Importance of the American Revolution. I'm Chris Cordani, your host. This is Book Spectrum. Let's get to the American Revolution and modern days today. Interestingly, free societies are criticized by the American left and the likes of those in the World Economic Forum. Perhaps those are the very types of people against whom the entire free world needs to revolt. Having said that, though, there seems to be a um, a sort of power grab amongst the political elite, or at least a, a, a move amongst them, and the, the culturally fashionable, if you will, to try to lessen the impacts of free societies and maybe make them less free. That's my observation. Um, what's yours? Well, am I far off here, I guess? That's that's the question I'm asking. And then then we'll get into what the American Revolution, why why this is very important when it comes to putting it into perspectives here. Well, I, you're not too far off. Um, we need to have a continuous civil dialogue about what freedom is and what the proper role of government in American society and in societies all over the world is. Um, the main thing that the American Revolution achieved was independence, not just independence for the United States, although obviously it achieved that, but personal independence, um, it, autonomy. People wanted to be free of the imposition of arist aristocrats, of monarchs, and of governments. Um, freedom uh, involves liberty. And liberty is the absence of restraint, um, restraint by government, restraint by others who want to impose their way of thinking on you. Um, so liberty was fundamental to the revolution. Natural and civil rights is, are, are, but also responsible citizenship to the degree that we are called upon to participate in public life and in government. Um, we have an equal share in it as citizens. Um, the revolution was in many ways a revolution against government. Um, people in the 18th century were, you know, they were citizens. They, they weren't citizens. They were subjects of monarchs. Um, they wanted to be citizens. They wanted to be free and independent citizens. And I know that, that today the, uh, you know, the famous rattlesnake flag with its motto, don't tread on me, has become politicized as a symbol of, of, some far right extremists, but in fact, that idea. No, the funny thing. The funny thing is, I, I would even say it about, hasn't really been. It's almost like it's being used by people on the other side to make them. It's it, it, it's basically a symbol of freedom. It's a base, it's a symbol of independence. And I think I've seen people um, from moderate to farther right use the flag. But I do want to say that um, it seems to be demonized nowadays, and the, the very concept of the idea of freedom in some factions here has been demonized and, and turned against and flag into something it really isn't. I agree with you about that because it, to me, it symbolizes a, the fundamental claim of the American revolution, which is the, is the absence of restraint within the bounds necessary in civil society um, and, and the fulfillment of our natural rights. Uh, we need to have a, a constant public dialogue about what are natural rights. That is one of the rights that inherit in all people everywhere, not just in America, but if they're natural rights, if they're the rights of man or rights of mankind or rights of human beings, they apply to everyone everywhere. Um, they're not dependent on what civil society you happen to live in. And then there are civil rights um, that are rights that are peculiar to the particular public life of a society. And they will vary somewhat from society to society. Um, if we're going to have a responsible, uh, intelligent dialogue in this country and everywhere about what public policy should be. You need to have a constant conception of what is a natural right, um, say the right to religious freedom, which almost all, all philosophers agree 
the right of conscience, the right uh, to worship as you wish, is a natural right uh, versus civil rights. Who votes and when? Uh, under what circumstances? Um, and we're not having those kinds of, I feel, civil dialogues that we need to have. So, for example, we're having you know, there, today, um, we sometimes get impassioned arguments, but, but not enough dialogue about uh, non-citizen voting, which is something which is being, has been proposed and adopted in some jurisdictions in this country. Um, is that consistent with the, the basic principles that, of, of the American Revolution, of our national heritage, of our history? Um, we need to have that kind of conversation. And one of the purposes of this book is to remind people what the fundamental ideals uh, established by the American Revolution are. The revolutionary leaders themselves, people of the revolutionary generation, expected us to evolve and to change over time. Um, they didn't expect us always to, to be concerned what their original ideas were and to, to be uh, slavishly obedient to them. They wanted us to be creative thinkers, but within the bounds of the basic principles of independence, liberty, equality, natural civil rights, responsible citizenship. Um, they built the foundation. It's, but we need to have a constant conversation within those boundaries. The free societies have actually uh, grown over the years, although there's something to be said for a lot of people who seem to be more comfortable in an authoritarian society. And I'm not talking about the, uh, 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 the Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un <laughs> North Korea type societies, but there are people who uh, stand for, let's say, the Soviet, old Soviet society. There are some people who really want to bring that sort of thinking back into the, uh, the world stage, if you will. There seem to be a lot of schools of thought when it comes to that sort of thing. However, one thing I do note is that uh, over the last uh, 300 years, monarchies are what had really fallen out of fashion, except in some very, very small circles anymore. Whether it be more authoritarian societies or less authoritarian, like the more free societies. Monarchy may have faded, but a vast proportion of the people of the world live in ter under tyrannical governments, governments that deny them fundamental freedoms. And, and, and Chris, anyone in the free world who has some kind of nostalgic yearning for Soviet style communism, uh, yeah. socialism, um, they simply don't understand. They, well, mo <laughs> most of them never lived under that, but I, I, I see what you're saying. How vicious those tyrannies were. The 20th century produced some of the most vicious tyrannies in world history. Um, they were yeah. autocratic governments. We don't want to live under them. But those are those are being whitewashed too. We talk about the American Revolution being whitewashed and pushed away. But think about it this way: the more authoritarian societies, like Mao and uh, and Stalin, what they did, and and it's sort of what some factions of American powerful here are doing as well. They erased their nation's histories to enhance their own agendas. Here in the U.S., we're again not to the extent that uh, Mao and Stalin were able to do that. But we're seeing a washing away of history, including the American Revolution, to push agendas and to create a less free nation in compliance with uh, some international factions, if you will. And I don't have to mention them. But what I can say is um, th this is getting dangerous because the people don't realize why Americans wanted to break free of the revolution. And in your book, definitely, I'm going to get back to that again. Jack Warren is my guest. He's the uh, author of Freedom, the, the Enduring Importance of the American Revolution. It set the tone for the idea that people can govern themselves, whereas we're now seeing, uh, again, an internationally slight swing into the idea that people shouldn't be trusted to govern themselves. This is where, again, your American Revolution has been kind of taking a backseat to other things around in, uh, in, in, our, in our public school system. How can we reverse this trend and make sure young Americans are properly taught factual history, but mainly the importance of why we had the American Revolution and its influence on the entire new world? Now, I'm talking about this, uh, Canada, uh, Mexico, and the South American nations who also sought and won independence. We're failing broadly across the United States to teach history well. And this is not because we don't have earnest and in many cases, able history teachers. But history has become increasingly politicized. 
Um, and so one has you know, his, history written uh, in the academy from the left and uh, very inf- less frequently from the right. Uh, both actually suffer from distortion because the authors are seeking a, to advance a present political agenda. Um, they have something they want to happen today. And so they're going to tell you a story about the past uh, and particularly when it deals with the American Revolution, something which will get you to reject the American Revolution, to despise the nation's origins. Um, and for example, I mean, let's, you know, if you've been tuned into the news in the last few years, you, you know this. Uh, the American Revolutionary Generation uh, did not abolish slavery. Uh, many of the leading leaders of the American Revolution were slave owners and slavers. And uh, for many people, uh, this means that whatever else they stood for uh, has no merit. They are, they, they are to be rejected out of hand. What I'm trying to do in this book is to explain, to begin with, in the middle of the 18th century, no one, no one was free. Um, people were, they, they, everybody lived out their life on a kind of scale of degrees of freedom. Uh, the, wealth, the, the, the well-to-do, the tiniest percentage of society enjoyed more freedom than others, although they were all subjects of some kind of monarchy. Um, and then you had women, all of whom were disfranchised and unable to participate in civil life of tiny percentage of people, even in Britain, which was regarded in the middle of the 18th century as the freest society in the world. Even in Britain, only a tiny percentage of people could vote. And even of those people who could vote, the, the, the practical effect of their of their votes was, was nil because frequently elections for, say, members of parliament um, were they had one candidate to vote for. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of a representative legislature elected on democratic principles is it was talked about in the 18th century in Britain and in elsewhere, but we invented it. Um, the first legislature in the world actually based on a count of the number of people who lived in a country with representation divided among them on some kind of equal basis on a national scale was in the United States. I mean, this is a basic idea which free societies have adopted everywhere. Um, and so the revolution is this moment when the world is offered an alternative, an alternative of personal independence, national independence in a world of empires. Um, I mean, we often forget um, that the United States is the first great nation in the world. Uh, to break away from modern colonial dependence and assert its independence. Um, you know, it, it's, it rejects the tyranny of empire uh, and, be, and adopts principles of, of free society, of liberty, equality, natural and civil rights, and responsible participatory citizenship. Those are new ideas, and those ideas are fundamental to the preservation of free societies in the world today. Yes, there are a lot of people who think that the world has become too complicated for free society, that it, we need an autocracy of experts, right? <laughs> an authoritarian yeah. state ruling us benevolently, of course, uh, but will take care of all of the, 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 the difficulties that require people smarter than you and me. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't think you believe it. I don't think your listeners believe that. Uh, I think free people, educated people, um, engaging in civil dialogue can come up with the best solutions to the problems that we face. And we face challenges like every generation. Um, and free society is the, is the answer to those things, not autocracy. Autocracy leads to tyranny and human misery, and it has everywhere in the world for all time. And anyone who promotes autocratic ideas is nuts. Well, maybe that's the problem. We have a lot of nuts people here, <laughs> a lot of crazies out there, if you will. And they've been given the microphone thanks to the Internet. But again, that's a difference. Wait a minute. I'm one of those, too. But I'm going to say I'm a crazy in a different direction. I'm a crazy that likes U.S. history and appreciates a free society. We're the crazies now, apparently, according to some of these people. But again, that's a rant for some other day and another interview. I would like to ask you, though, uh, what? Is what are maybe, and again, we discussed a lot of these. What's the one key thing you want uh, maybe a young reader 
a young reader, somebody who didn't get taught much about the revolution to take away from this book? That the revolution was the achievement of people like them. Too much we focus on George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, but they were ordinary people, people of every race, people of every religion, people of every age. For a young person, I want them to know that the, the, the army that won our independence was an army of teenagers. I, I, as a matter of fact, it's funny. Uh, when I was in first grade, we learned about Nathan Hale, but the only thing we learned about Nathan Hale is he said, I regret I have but one life to give for my country before he was hung. He was a, um, he was a star spy for a while. And, but, but it, and he's just barely graduated from college. It's, uh, he was 21 when he was hung. That's right. right. That's where I was going. Yes. And Lafayette, who is, you know, major general of the Continental Army, a French idealist who comes to America and comes from a very wealthy family, so Congress pays attention. Um, he was made a major general uh, in the United States Army, in the Continental Army, at the age of 19. Uh, now, I'm absolutely certain that George Washington, when he heard that Continental Congress had appointed this 19-year-old a major general, he shook his head. Um, but then he met Lafayette. He commanded Lafayette. Lafayette came to him, and it became clear that Lafayette wanted nothing more than to be a servant to Washington, to fight for uh, the freedom of the United States, which he believed was the beginning of the establishment of freedom all over the world. He was an impassioned idealist. Um, and Washington came to love him like a son. Um, they were very close to one another. And uh, Washington himself um, I'm, I'm thinking about your, your young reader, you know, they see a painting of George Washington and they, what it looks like is he's an old man because a lot of the portraits of this period are written, are, are painted when people are rich and old. Um, and so a lot of the portraits we have of Washington are of an old man or there. He's in his sixties, which is old in the 18th century. Um, and of course he's got, he's got powdered hair and that makes him look even older. The yeah, fact that was is a cool haircut of the time. So, right. But George Washington took command of the Continental Army at the age of 42. Uh, I know to a teenager that's going to sound like, well, he was an old guy, but he really wasn't. Uh, he commanded an army of young men. Um, a lot of the ordinary soldiers of the Continental Army were teenagers. Uh, and I mean, this the revolution was an achievement of the young. Yes, there were some old guys like Benjamin Franklin or Stephen Hopkins, the elderly statesman from Rhode Island. But but this was a, you know, the, a dynamic movement uh, driven by the aspirations of ordinary people and many of them young people. Jack Warren, thank you for being with us on Book Spectrum. Once again, the book is titled Freedom, the Enduring Importance of the American Revolution. Before we go, though, Jack, it, the book is backed by the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. Tell us a bit about that. Well, the Society of the Cincinnati was established at the very end of the American Revolutionary War by the officers of George Washington's army. Um, they wanted to create an organization which would perpetuate the ideals for which they had fought. Um, and of course, they came from all over uh, what was then the United States, from Georgia to Massachusetts, New Hampshire. They had come together in common cause to fight this war, but when the, they, they were going home at the end of the war, they, they would have no reason to get together again unless they created an organization to draw them together. And so they created this, the nation's first veterans organization uh, for officers of the Continental Army. And they would meet every three years in a national convention. They would have a chance to, to get back together with one another and reminisce like veterans will do. Uh, but they had a bigger purpose too. They wanted to perpetuate the memory of the American Revolution and its ideals. And in 2014, I was, I was the executive director of the Society of the Cincinnati for many years, and we created a, the American Revolution Institute to help carry out the mission, which was really, the, the mission was really uh, formulated with the birth of the society in 1783 to perpetuate forever the memory of that, this vast event is the way they described it, uh, through which they had lived and its, and its ideals. And the American Revolution Institute conducts uh, research library programs, museum programs, public tours, um, anything that it can do to perpetuate in the 
popular mind, the memory of the American Revolution. That's a wonderful headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, and I was privileged to be the founding director of the American Revolution Institute, uh, which is why you see their name under mine on the cover of Freedom. Jack Warren, thanks again for joining us. And uh, again, where can our listeners find your website where they can find more information about you and the book? Well, you can learn more about the book on the website of the American Revolution Institute, which is conveniently AmericanRevolutionInstitute.org. All run together. Uh, or the website of Lions Press, uh, which is the publisher of the book, L Y O N S. Uh, and uh, you can buy the book at all of the usual online outlets. It's also for sale in bookstores, uh, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, of course. Uh, the book is, is widely available, and uh, it seems to be doing very well. Thank you again, Jack Warren, for being with us. And thank you for listening to Book Spectrum. I'm Chris Cordani. And remember, keep turning those pages.